It's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage for our next leadership lesson, Mike Novakowski, President and CEO of EV Construction. <clears throat> Thank you, Nate. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm, I'm going to share a topic that I think is, can be very uncomfortable for a lot of people, and this idea of taking off your armor. This idea that vulnerability in your workplace could be a great benefit to you, to your people, to the clients that you serve has been something that I've been really uh, tracing after for the last 10 or 15 years to the point where I've had such an incredible journey that I'm, I'm blessed to be able to share some of that with you today. But I have to back up about 40 years ago, I had an incident, uh, a tragedy in my life that really defined my, me as a leader. And I, I hadn't really realized until many, many decades later that this event, when I was a young boy, 13 years old, this tragic event in my life put me in a place to look at life much differently based on how I reacted to that event. Now, I'm a contractor. Um, you would think of me as a commodity services provider, somebody who, you know, it's, it's all about low price. We're just looking for these people with no personalities to go out and build my buildings. And um, I didn't like that. I didn't want to be a commodity services provider, but here we are. We're working all across the United States. We have a national presence. We have this regional operation here in West Michigan. And we've had this growing company but what would really take us to the next level? What would help us become something more than the next contractor next door? And I'm taking this journey from a child into a leader, into a, a dynamic business and sharing that with you today. And it goes back in time a little bit to uh, a number of years ago when I decided I was gonna have a different experience with my leadership council. And in this case, we had my executive committee, there were four of us, and I said, you know, we relate really well at work, we're connected, we're fairly close, we kind of know each other, but I want to go deeper. And I want to take off my armor with you. So what we did was we invited this group to a retreat, we rented a condo, we each had our own room, we decided we were going to spend an overnight together, uh, we were going to do business during the day, but at night it was about really getting into a level of intimacy and I love that word intimacy, that if you draw it out, it's into me see. Get to know me as a person. And so I decided to bring this exercise called Lifeline that you can see here. In Lifeline, you would take a, a large sheet of paper. On one side of the, the paper, you'd put your earliest age. The next side, your, your current age. You'd draw a line there in the middle. Above the line are all the cool things that have happened in your life. Below the line are all the tragedies. So. I gave them some ideas. I said, you know, spend about 45 minutes putting this together, I'll go first. So here I stood, eight o'clock one evening in this condo with my executive team, getting ready to take off my armor in front of them. So I pulled this lifeline out, I put it up on an easel, and I started to go through it. Very first memory at four years old, I remember growing up in a house not too far from John Ball Park, and I was in a, an outlot, sand lot, and I found a buffalo head nickel, and I was sharing this, the joy, and how could this possibly be one of my earliest memories? And then I rolled into, later in my youth, uh, you know, I was 10 years old, and my dad and I were kicking butt at Pinewood Derby. I was a Cub Scout, three years in a row, winning first or second place in the Pinewood Derby, and they saw the joy of this young boy come out. And then I had to stop, and I had to share this tragedy that I, I had uh, alluded to earlier. At 13 years old, I was um, in a, in a uh, situation where my younger brother, 11-year-old brother, was with me. We went to a friend's house. We rode our bicycles there. One evening, we, we went to their pool swimming, and that evening, we decided we were going to have a sleepover at my house on the west side. And so we drove back, and, and it was at that time when this tragedy hit. My friend, best friend, had crossed the road, one of the major streets here in town, and right behind him was my younger brother, uh, Johnny, who was 11, and he got struck by a car. I watched his body fly up, land in the street, had no idea how I ended up screaming and running right out there in the middle of the street, seeing this broken young man sitting there. And I started to reenact, kind of relive that whole moment in front of my executive committee. And I told them that it was then that I felt that I lost my brother on my watch, that I was a disappointment to my parents and I was never gonna fail them again. Well, I was the first one to no surprise to go away to college, the first one to get a good job, the first one to become a VP, the first one to lead a company. And I look back at that time, that tragedy, that trauma in my life defined who I am to a great extent as a leader, but I didn't share that journey. It wasn't, 
it was two or three decades after it happened that I even really started to share what that was like with my own spouse. I had lost a great opportunity. And I went through this lifeline. And I started talking about the joys of my college graduation and building my first house and getting married and having twins, you know, on our first anniversary, having a boy-girl twins. Like, wow, how cool is that? And then my journey towards physical health and doing marathons and all these things. But all along the way, other challenges that I had. When I got done sharing my lifeline over about a 20-minute period of time, uh, the other three executives said, hey, can we have some more time? And I thought, oh, that's interesting. They realized that I took off my armor. I didn't talk new sports and weather. I went deep. And they wanted to do the same out of respect. They each went in turn, went through their lifeline. There were tears shed. There were hugs given. And when we left that day, we were connected in a way that we had never had been before as an executive committee. We had each other's backs. In fact, one of those executive committee members was actually a younger brother of mine, my youngest brother, Joe, who said, you know, I, I thought I knew you my whole life, but apparently I didn't. And thank you so much for sharing that. So this idea of taking off your armor to become human in front of your coworkers doesn't seem like something that is normal. It's not taught in business school. It's not something that we're super comfortable with. And HR departments almost cringe because they're all about conformance and being careful and don't go too deep. But I'm here to tell you that the world can change if you make a different attempt to let people know you and let them inside and see you as a real person. I took this opportunity that I learned at this executive retreat and I said, I'm gonna push this further in the organization. So imagine me taking about 15 of my field managers uh, of a construction company and my four or five executives at the time on a overnight retreat to do something similar. Well, we all met at five o'clock. We rented a house because I didn't want them isolating in a hotel room, but we rented a home where they could all sleep. We put them together in groups. We let them cook. We let them prepare meals together, do some teamwork, team bonding kind of stuff. After dinner, we had a couple drinks. We sat outside. We had a, a little bit of a bonfire and we had this, this uh, exercise called two truths and a lie. And it was just this fun, playful thing to kind of get the ice broken and get them ready for what was to occur next. You see, a week before this event, I had asked each of them to bring one item of significance with them to the retreat. This is a small item that's really meaningful to them. If perhaps the house was on fire, they'd run in and grab it because they'd really miss having it. And so here we were sitting in this house, 20 construction workers, all in these chairs that we found all over the house at nine o'clock at night, a couple drinks under our belts, very anxious. And I asked somebody to begin by sharing their story of their item of significance. And the very first person pulled out a photo album and he said, I brought this photo album of my daughter. You see, when she was 16, a week or two after she got her license, she got in a horrific car accident. I'll never forget getting the call from the police that said, your daughter's been in a really bad wreck. She's in the hospital, you need to come. And my wife and I looked at each other, fearful, tearful, made our way to the hospital. And he's paging through this book of the, the crushed car and her, his daughter in ICU and all these things. And he's reliving this in front of this group of 20 construction workers. And he hands the book around. It was almost like, you know, this, this magical moment of creating a really safe pace, place for him to do that. The very next person reached into their par pocket and they pull out this pebble. And I thought, oh no, you know, we just had a really good deep story on the uh, photo album. And he says, uh, he says, I brought this pebble. He said, I carry it with me because when my daughter was six or seven years old, I'll never forget, I was sitting out on my steps of my house. There were six or seven steps going down the front yard. And here's this six, seven-year-old daughter with not a care in the world, playing in the lawn, having a great time. And somehow she noticed that I was stressed. I had my head in my hands. Something was going on where she stopped what she was doing. She walked up to me. She knelt down into the plant, landscape bed picked up this pebble, gestured for me to open my hand up, put it in there, closed my hand and looked at me and said, Daddy, you know, I love you. And just, if you ever want to smile, if you ever want to not feel stressed or whatever she said, he goes, just rub this rock and, and you know, think of me. He holds this up, this rock up to the 20 of us and says, I've carried this in my pocket for eight years. My heart melted. The last one I'll share is a gentleman brought a hat and he said, you know, my mom had passed away a number of years before my dad, but I brought my dad's hat. He said, I got the call that fateful day when, when my dad passed away and 
you know, I was mourning already, and uh, my, na- my dad's neighbor called me and said, hey, you know, I'm so sorry to hear about the loss of your father. Um, is there anything I can do to help out right now? And he said, and he says, I, well, I don't know. There's, you know, it just happened. He says, well, there's people at your dad's house. There's cars backed up. It looks like they're moving some stuff. And the guy says, I didn't know what was going on. So I ran over to the house. I walk in, and to my dismay, to my horror, I see my siblings ransacking the house, taking the things that they wanted. So I, I looked over at the coat rack. I saw this hat hanging there. I picked it up. I could still smell my dad on the hat. I could remember my dad having me in his lap, driving on the tractor as he farmed. I looked in disgust at my siblings. I thought of my dad and his hat, and I left with this hat, and that's all I wanted. And I haven't talked to my siblings since. So imagine having these people all together to share these intimate stories about each other. The next day after we had conducted some regular business at noon, we were letting them head out to their job sites, and I saw two grown construction workers hug it out and say, you know, I love you, man. Not, you know, don't ever tell anybody I got teary-eyed, you know, fist bump. It was, thank you for what you shared. I got your back. For me, carrying that journey deeper into our organization was something that I thought was really important. So we created this system. This ended up being software. ended up being a book written about it. It ended up being so much more than I could ever expected. But we call it U-mapping. And the idea of you mapping is making our lives together meaningful at work, that it's not just Mike coming from his home, we leave all that behind, I walk in, punch in, do my job, go home. It's all blended together. And what we've seen is our people step up in a way that we've never seen before. A sample of my you map shows me at the very center, but there's a picture there, uh, and that's a brand icon. We ask each of our people to express yourself in your own brand icon. Tell us the story why this picture really represents who you are. If we look at this map, it really represents a left-brained approach and a right-brained approach to what the the way that we operate business. We needed to have our P&Ls. We need to know productivity. We need to have all those professional goals, responsibilities. But on the right side of this map is this idea that how do I get to know the individual? How do I care about their personal goals and all that? So when you look at mine on the right side, you see my lovely wife, Liz, my children, I'm asked, what are your superpowers? What are the things that you have or you do at home or at work that are really amazing? And then we have conversations with employees about what, are, what do you think your coworkers think about you and your superpowers at work? We talk about our personal goals. I'm a runner. I wanted to run the Berlin Marathon. In fact, it would have been a couple of weeks ago. It didn't happen. Darn COVID. But all, my, my people are rooting for me to achieve my personal goals. I look at my professional goals. Even as a CEO, I have coaching and development issues that I need to go through. I want my whole team to know that about me, that I'm not totally secure with who I am as a leader, that I'm still a work in progress. My top responsibilities are not what I think are the most important, it's what everybody thinks. So when I look through the power of this UMAP, or this opportunity to share much more about myself, I realize that I'm making a much more meaningful and deep connection in the world. So think about it. If you want to really change the relationship between you and your uh, workers, if you want to blend and kind of almost uh, make it uh, difficult to distinguish the difference between um, you at home and you at work, then you have this opportunity to take off that armor. I've shared so many stories with the people that I've worked alongside that now I'm just Mike. I'm not the scary CEO sitting in his office. I'm I'm an approachable person who has flaws, who's had fears, who's had issues. And I found that each of my people that I work alongside are the same. So as we journey together to try and have an incredible company and an incredible community, we know that this power of taking off your armor to become more intimate with our relationships at work has a huge benefit. So I will probably never be able to um, express as much as I would like to the power of this, but um, the story's real. The benefits for it are great. I love my job. I love who I work with. And uh, retirement is in no near future for me because uh, it's been a great part of uh, what I've learned in my leadership journey. So uh, thank you for allowing me to share today. Thanks, Mike. Take off your armor. So Mike doesn't say that to us casually. This isn't just his journey, he says it to us because he's experienced what it did for his leadership and he knows what it will do for our leadership. So if you have a 
sheet of paper next to you without a single action item on it, maybe you should jot down Lifeline. Have you done that with your team? Maybe you should jot down significant object. Have you asked your team to bring something meaningful from their life in to share together? Trust me, trust Mike, you won't regret it. We will now take one last commercial break before we hear from Brian Stikes, Google Cloud's technical director for the office of the CTO.